Hey, this is Johnny Burke. I'm here on the Lone Star Plate. I'm here talking about my new album, Behind the Pine Curtain. Thanks to my man, Patrick, for having me on. It's a good one. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Lone Star Plate podcast. This is a special introduction for this episode. Uh, this is going to be part two of our Johnny Burke interview. So if you haven't checked out part one from last week, uh, I may want to check that out before continuing uh, this conversation because we just uh, pick up where we left off. So again, we'll put a link in the description, part one. This is going to be part two, so the finale of this interview. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoy it. Um, one quick thing. Um, at the very end, my camera goes out. So it's only Johnny's camera. Again, this interview was not meant to be uh, this long, you know, we just started talking and got along so well and, and Johnny's story was just so moving and so powerful and he was just so open and honest and he's just such a great guy. So, um, you know, we, we just kept it going. So anyway, yeah, so it's just Johnny's camera there at the end. And um, yeah, so anyway, everything else is the same, all the same breaks and everything. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, again, apologize for this intro right here. I'm recording it on my iPhone, but we needed something at the beginning for a little context. So anyway, let's get to the interview. Second part of Johnny Burke. Enjoy. All right, we're back with Johnny Burke. Again, his album, Behind the Pine Curtain. Don't forget, April 26th. Um, check him out on his website. We'll put a link in the description, obviously, for that as well. Um, check out the single that's out. Uh, it is literally the title track, Behind the Pine Curtain. So we've been talking yeah. about a story so inspiring. Johnny's been so open and honest with us. Um, and, yeah, I know y'all are enjoying this so far. So let's just keep going with some of these uh, questions. So, look, Johnny, I have more this will be a little more specific. And again, I, I, if it's not anything you want to talk about, please just say, you know what? Next question, Patrick. Uh, but I was curious if, was there any sort of like intense or scary moment or what was the most intense or scary moment for you while you were incarcerated? Um, uh, I, I guess those are always just when it's your first moment, say walking into your first long-term incarceration, uh, just the unknown not the unknown yeah uh, precisely i um you know you mentioned earlier get getting comfortable in where you're actually uh, living for the year and you know i never got comfortable per se but there was a time where you i get um where i'm laughing at uh my you call him a celly even though you're not in one cell, it's a 66 man unair conditioned big dorm uh, with bunk beds, real close. And my celly was a guy, he had done 18 on a 25. Um, so 18 years on a 25 year sentence for first degree murder. And oh, he, wow. he was a great guy. And as far as I knew, uh, now what he did 18 years ago was reprehensible. But uh, he had spent 18 years there, and one of his first things he told me was, uh, well, you know, I was also convicted of armed robbery, but I never robbed anybody. It's, uh, you don't want to be known as a thief in there because thieves might steal from each other in close quarters. But, uh, you know, he said, I took that charge for a homegirl. 18 years ago, I was locked up in county, about to go on trial for my murder charge, and I just said, yeah, I robbed that person because I'm not going to get any more time for robbing somebody. But that wasn't – I didn't do that. My homegirl did that, so I took that charge for her. Now, the murder charge, that was just a bad decision on my part. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> and he tells me this as I'm moving in as his, uh, you know, as you're just cut, first time meeting him, he's telling you this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, usually I would be, I mean, if I right now maybe met somebody like that, maybe be scared to death of them. But after being in the, that kind of place for that kind of time, I naturally laughed because, hey, it looks, it made me laugh and it looks sure. better on me if I'm a, hey, <laughs> you know, homeboy, what's up? Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I would think it would, uh, the scariest moments would be 
going to every new unit because you, then you got to get a new gang of friends and you don't, um, you know, you want to stay away from the politics of the race gangs. And it's just all this whole horrible thing that we could have a 36 hour show on if, you know, you had a his, historian on Texas prison history, but, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, this is about the, the record that I put out. And I, I certainly used quotes from those people like him that I met, uh, in some of these songs. Sure. Absolutely. Do, do they, do they, um, do some of these people know that you've put out this album? I'm not sure there's one, uh, the guy I was just talking about, the 18 on a 25 guy. Yeah. He got out. Seems to be a pro, uh, okay member of society. Follows me on Instagram. Wow. Look at that, man. We've exchanged messages. Uh, you know, as soon as I get out, I want to forget about that kind of stuff as soon as possible. But then I also have to remember, uh, you know, my celly was the murderer. Nobody fucked with our side of the, the dorm having him over there. Uh, absolutely. It was like, no, no, I, I ain't going over that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He said murdering somebody was just a bad business decision. I'm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Can you imagine hearing that? That is, that is, that's a wacky sort of surreal moment, I'm sure, for you. Yeah. Right? Just a surreal moment. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I'm, wow. That's, um, that's interesting. You handled it. You handled it great. It sounds like, um, yeah, that's got to be a tough struggle to want to maybe distance yourself from that period. But at the same time, you know, you've got people reaching out or talking about you putting out this album, right? It's going to keep these sort of, I don't want to say wounds, op re you know, reopening the wounds, but it's sort of on the forefront of your mind. But again, like we talked about in the beginning, right? The goal now is to tell that story, but also if it helps people Right. That's a great benefit. So, you know, that's got to just be a tough struggle. Yeah. I've, I've always thought of it as a cautionary tale being that it can be prevented by um, people, especially ones that I know that hey, man, you don't need to be drinking and driving and that can have much more disastrous consequences than you know, even what you have to hear from me, which is not that great. But, um, uh, you it's know, crazy that you got a year for for that. I mean, I've I've heard of people that have four or five of them, and nothing. There are always those stories. Um, a lot of them have been convicted many decades ago before stuff was put into place to where um, a third DWI is a felony, but uh, it's a third degree felony, which is two to ten years in jail. And uh, yeah, wow. I'm still on probation. Uh, I did, probation I just didn't know period. that. I, I, I was sentenced know, so. to 10 years in jail in prison in TDCJ. So I, I would not be out if I had not been uh, probated out uh, until 2028. And there are people that I met in there who got their four DWIs that, that got the full um, 10 years. Yeah. Wow. And people that had other charges attached to it. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm not here to judge what uh, is is right or wrong. It, they, you know, people die from people drinking and driving, and it's a preventable. For sure, absolutely, without a doubt, uh, without a doubt. So, um, yeah, that's. But, an, I, but I certainly got yeah. that kind of backslapping uh, sure. deal from close friends. Hey, you didn't, you didn't deserve that, and uh, you know, I, I didn't. Uh, as we talked about during the break, I didn't come out learning a lesson about uh per se my behavior because i knew it was wrong to to do that uh years ago i um but i certainly didn't feel like i got a raw deal because um... hope you're enjoying the second part to our interview with johnny burke please if you haven't check out the first part put a link in the description of course um just want to tell you about quickly our social media okay instagram TikTok. Facebook, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button, the notification bell. That would really help out a lot. But basically, look, you can find cool behind the scenes stuff, extra photos, pictures, stories, quotes, 
any additional stuff, plus all the different places in Texas, we share their stuff too. So you can find out about other stuff, all the other, uh, you know, musicians and actors and, uh, you know, food places that we support also online. So anyway, check us out and don't forget our sponsor, Texas Real Food. They got a huge social media. So please check that out too. Texas Real Food. We'll put a link in the description. Um, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please, let's get back to the interview with Johnny Burke. Enough of me blabbering. Do you think that's the best way to prevent people from drinking and driving? To incarcerate them, right? Like, because it, 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 isn't that the goal? Shouldn't that be our goal as a society? Yeah. Is, is to prevent, right? To, to sort of take someone who's made a mistake and keep them from making that? Or are we in the business of just punishing and forgetting? Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a hard one. And I, to be honest, even after that time and all of this kind of thinking, I really don't have an answer. Um, it's complicated. I would say right? it's up to the legislator and the judges, but uh, yeah. sure. we live here in Texas. I don't know if that's the smartest thing to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, that's funny. I know that the reason that I was probated instead of serving that, uh, 10 years where I would have been up for, uh, parole at one and a half or two years, um, on a state charge. If, if you've got a federal charge, they, you have to serve like at least, I can't remember like half of it or something, but, uh, yeah, for a state charge, like on a third degree felony, um, I could only serve that short of time if I went through a program, which now almost every long-term felon has to go through coming out of long-term uh, incarceration, which is, it's called safe P. Okay. Which it's kind of like we talked about earlier about the holiday unit. It sounds like a yeah. really nice... <laughs> It's a nice euphemism. Yeah. Um, so who, who's oh, that naming this sweet. stuff here in Texas? Right, yeah. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a abbreviation, I guess, for Substance Abuse Felony Punishment Facility. And uh, the main thing you got to remember there is the last two words is punishment facility. Uh, that sounds like... A torture... Right? I mean, that just doesn't... What a horrible name to name... Again, what are we in the business of? In my opinion, we should be in the business of reintegrating people into society. Okay, you made yeah. a mistake. You paid your time. Get back to living. I, you know, I have a lot of strong opinions about this stuff, man, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I don't, I believe, um, you know, people who've been convicted should still vote. They should still have a say. I, I just disagree with pulling all this stuff away from people yeah. and just punishing them but no real sort of trying to help or re again reintegrate or yeah i just i just don't get it um yeah i just don't get that that's where it, it became very complex to me because i certainly uh did uh share that exact view before i went in and still do um but it became so much more layered where i oh, realized um, of course you know, these guys, most of them are coming from long-term facilities where they're friends with the guards. They cook lunch together. The, the, the guards' whole deal is to not upset prisoners so they don't riot because they outnumber the guards so many to one sure. in a, uh, a good point. Texas penitentiary system. Now, this program that they reintegrate you with is a punishment facility, and it's, they employ a third party which is uh, some of these places. Um, one, of them, one of the big ones is called uh, MTC. It's out of Utah. I had to look up these places after I got out. Um, but a lot of polit national politicians ad uh, lobby and advocate on behalf of these companies saying they're helping people reintegrate. Uh, whereas, say, uh, in the penitentiaries I was at, we had to organize our own 12-step meetings. There was no anything called a 12-step program in there. It was a punishment. Uh, you work eight hours a day, and for six hours a day, you're sitting in a chair with your hands on your legs, and you're watching the same videos, hearing the same lectures. If you move, everybody is uh, 
punished, you know, phone calls taken away, uh, uh, being able to buy from the uh, commissary, stuff that the only things you have to look forward to there and to. And you go, wow, man, this is a bigger political kind of thing than you think it is. Um, and there's not an easy explanation when you see, you know, violent criminals actually in there going, hey, man, I'm going to get out and I'm going to be violent again. But at the same time going, this, uh, like this, this program that I was in, the reason I was, got to serve less time, uh, they made the guards be cruel to us. I mean, there would be these third party private company people that they come in and banging on the walls at 4.30 in the morning, even if you're not waking up to uh, work at four, the first shift at 4.30. And uh, it, the whole, it was explained to me many times uh, because it, they kind of give you a hierarchy of, um, you know, you can move up in a, like, uh, system of governments, uh, governance in a 66-man dorm. And uh, many of these people that started trusting me that are in this uh, private company uh, that is employed say, hey, man, I feel bad about this too. I'm just told to be here as cruel as possible to you people so that there's less, uh, there's a better recidivism rate yeah. of less people returning to jail. They say, we've done these studies. If we can be more cruel to you people, you'll go we won't commit crimes and go back to jail. Okay. Now, on one hand, you go, well, does that work? Because I certainly never want to go back there. But at the same time, people that have half, because uh, at the time I was in there about four years ago, everybody, it used to be you were just paroled. You know, you serve your time. You could have been in one of these places where it's, you made your homeboys over five, 10, 12 years. You get out, you're paroled. Parole is not that big a deal as, as say, like a probationary period is. And, uh, but no, you got to go through six, eight, 12 months, depending on how you react to it, of this private company being cruel to you and examining how you're doing. Cause we want to, we want to make sure you don't want to come back here, hang out with your homeboys. Uh, and, how traumatic that must be for some people because i knew i was getting out within the span of a year and i i certainly built up a uh, hey i'm going to be tough persona to get through the whole thing but i knew when my time was up uh, to think that hey man this is going to go on for years and years and years uh i'm sure that that just being tough doesn't mean that you don't have post-traumatic stress later you know absolutely of course one of my favorite things i do to this day is almost every monday i work with a voice a uh, deal called soldier songs and voices and uh, i just had to give a shout out to all those people here now because um it's veterans that have gone through trauma and we work through songwriting every week uh, my friend dustin welsh is the president there's like 12 chapters in a bunch of different states um how that kind of trauma that the, our veterans uh, had to go through it's great working on songs with them um i was lucky in the prison process to not have to have a long term more than a year deal but um people that are there for 10 12 15 20 years um how does that affect them to be you know they're getting the stick not the carrot on their way out and uh feeling more trauma by this company that's making uh, the people employed by the company making much more than our private that's, prison guards and uh, 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 our uh, prison guards in texas uh, yeah yes absolutely no, I'm not for privatizing prisons or privatizing these programs or any yeah. of that. It's just a financial incentive, right? And then yeah. we're going to be cruel. I'd like to see these studies you're talking about uh, that this company's mentioning, because the studies that I've read and seen, I used to live in Europe, uh, actually, and um, the studies and stuff I've seen are the complete opposite of that, literally yeah. the complete opposite of that. Um, 
yeah, it's insane. Um, I actually have, um, so my wife's, my sister-in-law, my wife's Spanish, um, her, she works at a prison in Spain. She's a, uh, she's a prison guard. Okay. Wow. But let me tell you something. The prison guards over there are not the same prison guards here. The way they handle prison guards is much different. So she just wears normal clothes. She's really a social, their prison guards are like slash social workers. Yeah. So they help you. They, whatever. It's like, they're not there with, you know, it does, it's not how they walk around. Like we're here to enforce or this or that. I'm not saying they don't have security there or something like that, but for the most part, their guards are like their weapons, a pen, they can right. a pen and a pad that there is no weapon. That's not how they think their, their goal. When you get in prison is to get you out and live a better life. That's yeah. their goal, not to punish you. They never even bring that up. It's never about making you pay for what you did. Now, again, I'm not saying people, right, don't, you know, you don't need to face your consequences or your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the goal should be to get out. And I, I just remember talking to her about so much of that stuff. Um, it's insane. They, they have a complete, uh, their opinion of the United States justice system is, is not good. Um, just, yeah, just, be, I right, mean, just our approach to it, I think, is what scares them. Yeah. Uh, and again, like I said, my understanding of our, maybe not our justice system per se, but uh, how we, our penal system in the That's United a better, States. that's a better, yeah, you're right. The changed, penal system. Um, because... I, uh, it's, it's such a multi-layered, multi-faceted thing to me now. I certainly, uh, I met prison guards in there that are exactly like you're talking about, uh, people that work for the state that are, that are, were good hearted people that you would talk to every day and it made your day better that they were on the shift. When That's you awesome. That That's morning. awesome. Or that if you're working in the laundry or, um, uh, you know, wherever you ended up that they, that they were on the shift and they have come like any human being, um, compassion and, uh, you know, are thinking not just about themselves, but what you're going through. And then of course you meet the opposite who are happy, makes them happy to be cruel and, um, to persecute other people. And the exact same thing with the other prisoners, you know, cause you had to spend, uh, every day with them and, and I certainly saw people and got released with people who I said, man, if I saw that motherfucker in my neighborhood, I would just shoot him on uh, sight because he ain't coming near my home. He's a, he's uh, a bad dude. Yeah. He's uh that's interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, that's interesting. And I understand, you know, people are coming from certain places that it's, sure, you know, it's certainly malicious people. And then there's also the guards that are that same way that just want to make your um, life that much harder. Uh, now, that being said, the policies that we're talking about, I think the privatization of prisons certainly makes uh, the cruelty more normalized in a bigger way than just individuals interacting like I'm talking about because there's good people and bad people everywhere. Sure. Obviously. Absolutely. to a varying degree um but yeah i more of a I, systemic issue with that with yeah the privatization. The privatization of prisons uh, i think is uh, you're incentivized to get to have prisoners right like yeah. you get literally getting paid for them so why yeah. would you want an empty prison there's an incentive by the state and uh that first place i went i guess it's out of outside of henderson in uh northeast texas uh, that was a private prison. There was no state of Texas employed guards. They were, uh, you How know, we sometimes do that? people coming to your door to open it up in the morning look like Walmart greeters. Um, just like, ah, oh, I can't deal with this. They'll shut the door every night. Uh, you know, we there would be what we call gladiator fights in the big public bathroom that has three showers and three shitters. And people are just wailing on each other and making bets with their, you know, whatever they can buy off commissary every, every two weeks. Uh, and it, it was just a nightmare. But once a oh month, God. there would be auditors from TDCJ 
it was the only time TD, the, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice would come around because it was a private prison that TDCJ is paying them big bucks to house this a shit ton more prisoners. And uh, we would be threatened. I mean, I, I'm not saying that lightly. We would be threatened in our groups. Hey, the, like there's a bug infestation. Don't, you know, if you're going to be written up or you're going to be uh, when people would raise their hands and, you know, there's, there's certain, hey, I'm going to be a rabble rouser. Hey, what's the fucking deal with the flies or whatever? And uh, we'd, have, we'd have to find our own uh, homemade methods of like, you know, peanut butter and a fly trap or whatever in the showers so we wouldn't get swarmed with flies. Uh, but yeah, the, the officials, the higher officials in those, in that private prison would say, you privately to these uh, people that spoke up much more than me, you will do a harder sentence than you have right now if you speak up when the TDCJ auditors come around. Oh, that's, that's uh, messed up. I certainly saw people get comm their sentences. Um, they got sent elsewhere when they started a petition that they were planning to send to the state senates or something, you know. And I, Man. I remember thinking, wow, why would you think of sending something to the Texas state senate? <laughs> like, right, yeah. That, well, that's fir be... their first mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, these guys go, hey, man, we got to speak up for this. You know, this is wrong. I've been at different places. And uh, I guess. I, but I can understand their passion for it. I, yeah. would, I would I would probably that would be me too I couldn't yeah. I don't know I, maybe I don't know I guess I hear I'm talking like I'm some fucking tough guy like uh yeah I love when guys do that like oh yeah I'd, I'd jump in front of a bullet I really have no idea what I would do in those situations right like, well it was such a great question you asked earlier about the number of different uh facilities I went to and every single one of them was different there was no common thread through any of them it's uh, crazy what are we doing, right? Like, what, what? imagine if our education system was like that. And in some ways, maybe you could say that. But, right, like, we're supposed to have this... Uh, I feel like the Texas penal system should be working together, right? And have this nice, harmonious um, agenda and execution of the way we treat... Uh, not, not execution in that sense. Execution of, right, uh, the policies and, and things like that that are going on at these prisons. But it's not. It sounds like everyone's just doing whatever they want at their own place yeah that's it's a very confederated system it's not a uh federalized unified yeah. system i would say yeah. yeah that seems fractured and and not uh progressive or productive yeah i would say um there's probably good people that i had met in there that if they were in the wrong prison when they got released are gonna have a lot less chance of making it on the outside than oh, uh, say, man, maybe a, a bad person who had the right guard for a while and who had the right a absolutely and warden. Uh, yep, I believe that makes a difference, man. I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. And no, I guess man, that... you know you could probably say that for anything, for education, for healthcare, sure. and we're I'm getting very broad there, but um, you know, the, there's the old quote: the the older I get. The more experience I get, the less I know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You, you know, you, you got to say, man, there's there's good people out there. And there's, you don't want to say good versus evil, but there, there's the not as good people out there. And, um, you know, you, at the end of the day, you just have to go, man, I hope this story resonates with some people and that it's. Um, it will. I'm sure it has already, right? You're, you're, uh, have you heard from that? That's a good, that's a good, you know, just to pivot here real quick. Um, it's a good sort of point you're bringing up. Have you, um, experienced any stories from anybody that has sort of heard your, you know, your story, like that it's affected them? That's yeah. Them, I hear, right? um, I hear those after I play the set now. That's awesome. Um, which, like I said, um, and it's probably something in our society or whatever. Nobody wants to talk about their brother or their cousin or their aunt or their uh, whoever that was incarcerated for any length of time. Um, 
you certainly hear the stories at the end. Of, oh yeah, I got, I got drunk and I got locked up in the drunk tank for one night. Um, I went to County one time for parking tickets. I didn't pay or, or speeding ticket or something. And they threw me in right, for, yeah. for one night. Uh, yeah. And that, and that was, I'll, I'll be honest. It was fucking terrifying. Just yeah. that. So I can't even imagine to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly got a response from it from people that I wouldn't think otherwise. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Like I said, there were, um, before I wouldn't even went in, um, when it was a very hard time for me, they, uh, there were people that reached out that said, Hey, I don't know anything about this personally, but I've got somebody you can talk to that has, you know, gone through the experience and, uh, those things helped out immensely to me. So uh, I hope just being able to talk about this and sing these songs. Uh, I know, man, I'm, uh, I'm usually such a lighthearted guy, but I don't get to talk about this much. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these songs, uh, the only way I can deal with them is humor. And sure. I hope there's people find the humor in this. Um, sure. No, I appreciate the humor. I, I, that's how I would handle it too. I'm, I'm all about that. I think humor is a big, um, it's it's more important in our lives than we think being able to laugh and um yeah i think it helps a lot to be honest i love to laugh I, and that's how i get over a lot of things uh, yeah to oh. be honest uh traumatic things i do no i get that 100 percent. look let's let's take one last quick break johnny we've kind of gone over a little bit but i uh, we'll come back and it'll just be the last quick segment uh last couple questions um and we'll just you know we'll finish out here i don't want to take up too much of your time so we have Robert Strong with Wingman and Kitchens here in Austin, Texas. We're on the Lone Star Podcast Plate of the Week. We're just going to show you around our neighborhood. I'm Patrick, host of the Lone Star Plate Podcast, and this is our Plate of the Week teaser, where we highlight a Texas restaurant we feel is worth a trip. And this week, we have a special episode. We chose Wingman Kitchens, which is a commercial kitchen home to countless chefs and food businesses in Austin, Texas. It's located east of downtown in a complex called Springdale General. Make sure and check out the full video when it's released later in the week on YouTube. Owners Max Kunick and Robert Strong are good friends of mine. I've known them almost 10 years now. When we started this series, it was only a matter of time before we visited them. They have successfully run this kitchen for a few years now and have become a go-to for some of Austin's hottest cooks. Robert gives us a behind the scenes look behind the doors and gives us a tour explaining their vision. It was a fun trip with a lot of laughs and as always, I learned some things along the way and you will too. What is a commercial shared kitchen and how do you get into one? What can you use it for? How much does it cost? We also get a close look at a local spot who serves lunch out of the kitchen to the public. Did I forget to mention that? That's what makes this place unique. They allow businesses to serve directly to the public there. No other commercial kitchen in Austin does that, yet alone Texas. It's an edge they hope sets them apart, and it does. And of course, running a kitchen always has its problems, and this particular trip was no exception. Um, you see this little smoke here, what's that? You see that? Oh that? yeah, oh you're right. Oh my gosh, you're right, smoke is coming out of there. Check out the full episode later in the week to find out what happened. I'm Patrick, and this was our Plate of the Week teaser. Check out our YouTube for other awesome Plate of the Week videos. You know, the, the bio the publicist sends out is only so many words long, and you can only include so many things. And, uh, you know, even each song, uh, hey, has three or four verses, and there's... 10 of them on the record. Uh, the reasoning behind this is uh, the reason that I in, chose to do, uh, do instead of, you know, an album where it's three songs about prison, three songs about girls, three songs about uh, law, life or my dog, whatever, uh, to do, hey, man, we're doing a whole album of thematically tied to my time in prison is... Cause like I said, I don't want to have to do a second one <laughs> unless uh, yeah. it is. and, uh, it's Not for sure. It's great to, to finally have, uh, you know, if I'm talking to somebody about a, a press quote or something, it's going to be very short and, 
to do this over a, a podcast is um, with somebody who's asking such good questions. It means a lot to me. So, oh man, absolutely, brother. Of course, it's just my pleasure, man. Uh, you're you're doing everything. We're selfish. You're self. You know, I'm I'm selfishly like you know, learning from all this, like, I'm, you know, and I know that it's, it's going to help a lot of people to hear all of this and fascinate a lot of people, uh, and make people look into these things, um, to be well, honest. Yeah. So it's going to be one of my favorite things that I uh, get to share about this album is, Hey, if you want to learn about the album, uh, how this was made and the backstory, go listen to this. Like, don't, uh, not necessarily don't read the bio, don't listen, but, uh, Hey, man, go listen to this conversation. This is, you know, you can't replicate this. This is, yeah, th this is what we want to do. This is what we tried to do, right? This is, this is the whole point of this podcast. So no, I appreciate um, everything you're, you're saying and, and doing this. And again, your openness. So yeah, let's, let's, I'm honestly, this even little bit, we're probably going to keep it. Cause I even like this, all this stuff you're saying, man, I don't even know if I want to cut anything, even our breaks. It's like, everything's been gold, Johnny, Jesus. I like, <laughs> I wish every guest was, uh, is amazing as you are man so um well let's let's just you know i got a couple last questions um that i think you will appreciate um so yeah let, let me just ask these so th this is what i would ask you kind of sort of answered it but maybe you want to clarify it or put it in a different framework so i would ask you and i'm sure you've heard this but wh what's the biggest lesson you've learned from your time served yeah uh it'd be not going back there uh and that's you know i i don't intend on breaking any laws whatsoever and i certainly wish i didn't break those laws but the the laws that i broke are there for a reason and uh i certainly uh you know i don't want to when we're talking about this headier, um, you know, more philosophical kind of stuff, go that, hey, man, I didn't have time to think about that kind of stuff when I was in there. It, it certainly was a, a violent, tense place to where my first thought was self-preservation. Um, so I get to talk about this stuff years later, uh, but... I, yeah, my, my first lesson was to never go back there. Never push yourself in a place or do anything that would make you go back there. Yeah, that's a great lesson, man. Um, you know, it would be cool, just as a side note, if you could somehow go back to that one place where you played and go do another show there, dude, that for those people. I, I bet they were really sad when you left and weren't playing anymore. It's funny. Uh, when I first started talking about putting out this album, I was talking about... Uh, I was talking to an old manager of mine. Uh, he managed my, like the first band I had. Um, I think he started managing us when I was like 19. We'd started when we were like 15. But uh, his, his name's Mike Crowley. He, I still talk to him all the time. Uh, but his first job was working for Colonel Tom Parker when he was a teenager. He's retired, oh, wow. he's retired now. <laughs> wow. uh, but he did booking for Led Zeppelin, you know, road management, Dylan tour. Yeah. And uh, his whole thing, which when he heard the album and we talked about it, many, you know, for many, many hours, he hasn't worked for, we haven't worked together in uh, probably 15 years, but we still talk all the time. And uh, he kept telling me, man, you just got to, you got to get people involved in the criminal justice side of it. Uh, of his whole thing was wanting to talk to people who uh, had been incarcerated, their families. Um, and for me, it's been uh, not wanting to to publicize that or romanticize that because I have those conversations in private, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it's. Uh, I forget what was the original question. No, I, I was saying you should go back to that place where you played and and try to do a show. Yeah, there again, yeah. You um, know. We talked about at one point tr um, trying to reach out to TDCJ to do a concert at the place north of Abilene, Breckenridge, Texas. It's yeah, called, and go up there and do the same concert that I was doing every Friday afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, they they weren't uh, down for that. Yeah, I mean they're. 
I don't know about uh, anybody else, but I, uh, I, I'm not really <laughs> keen you, on wanting you're, to go. You're more, yeah, you're more <laughs> like, you know what? Not, not really uh, trying to go back to that place to do that show. No, I get yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I don't I mean it. that in a, a less compassionate way. I mean, uh, I hey man, I did my shows though there, and I would, I would feel, um, I feel like going back would be a pub publicity stunt to not at all if, if they let me do it i don't see tdcj letting me do it so i mean you're right it's texas you know, right? cutting the man short here. Uh, <laughs> yeah but uh yeah you know that that was that was real in those times playing for those 65 other people in that I, dorm i every see time. what you mean yeah, and some people you, you know hated it there were uh i certainly had to ask people that I knew that were like aspiring rappers to go, Hey man, double D's got the next 20 minutes, you know, cause you had to, we all got to keep the peace. It's like, nobody wants to hear the same, uh, you know, lots of times the white people would be on um, play the David Allen co songs. And I know all those David Allen co songs, but do I want to play all of them? You know, <laughs> Hey, man, double D he's got some raps. He's joining in here. You know, we're promoting unity through music. Hell yeah. I would have played some guitar for him. Hey man. All right, let's go. Right. Like, yeah. Uh, well, um, or if they, if they're down for it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I certainly couldn't do that going and posing for somebody in front of, uh, 66 or even more people. If, uh, like I said, it probably wouldn't even be allowed through TDCJ. Yeah. There, there was uh, a Christian group that was allowed to play for the whole unit one time when I was there, but, uh, yeah. okay course i don't that's weird but yeah. all right <laughs> okay uh well are you a uh, are you a religious man did did uh did that help you get through your time at all uh i certainly uh the when you first get there the only thing you're allowed is the bible and uh you know i was raised in a, a presbyterian uh family it was not especially religious uh which i really feel fortunate about because I don't have the uh, the point of view to where, say, if I was like a strict Baptist to where I have the rebellion against any kind of reading the Bible or uh, say if I was raised atheist or something. I feel like um, my parents certainly, uh, I feel great that they're still alive and I was raised on a diet of compassion for other people. Uh, Hey, mom and dad, I know you don't know what podcasts are, but, uh, yeah, I, I certainly, uh, read the Bible when I was allowed, uh, I, I'm a big reader anyway. And, uh, I, I would have read it too. Um, I, I mean, I'm actually an atheist, um, but I would have read it. Anyway. I've actually read it lots of times, uh, to be honest yeah. with you. It's a fascinating book, uh, you know, I, uh, but you I know. could understand if you're that could help you get through that time. I've I've heard of that a lot, right? People uh, leaning Anything, on. Anything uh, when I was in the bird unit in Huntsville, when the only thing I was allowed was a Bible. Uh, I I don't know. Uh, I don't really profess to believe anything, but I um, you know I've always studied the stuff of comparative mythology and literature, most notably the teachings of Joseph Campbell got me through a lot being able to say hey whether this is real or not you can learn the lessons of it yeah i agree 100 percent. Uh, i uh yeah certainly you know got like a quarter way through the bible before i was ever transferred of going you know yeah this is this is useful this is and uh i think that's the biggest thing when i read anything is what, what can i get learned, useful out of it for myself yeah 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 uh, totally. i've learned that from many teachers that have been helpful and some not so helpful hey is this <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, uh, i i have to remember that of what my time served was is uh hey man is this going to be of any use to you are you just going to be resentful about it the rest of your life um you know do you want to go out and make it a whole sort of teaching philosophy which like i said i don't personally want to do but there's certain things that i uh you're not trying to preach exactly right? yeah, I'm trying yeah. To say, hey man this was my experience like i would do say with any other album like you brought up at the beginning of the show where it's i put out the albums before about hey man i went through this breakup and it was it was terrible 
and uh, here's these songs about girls and there's nothing wrong with that that might be my next absolutely. album absolutely i've written lots of songs like that myself uh, there's yeah. there's tons of you know uh, albums that are better than mine that are about those kind of things uh this one was just different i guess as a writer because it was harder for me uh, oh yeah and you know this interview would have been much more hard for me if uh you know thank you for uh being such a, a great host that uh you know at the end of the day i'm i if this wasn't posted publicly anywhere i'm grateful we had this conversation i agree man I'm, this is why i love what i do is, is i get to have these conversations with amazing people and again i selfishly take from it i learn from these things i I listen and I take into account what people are saying to me and their life stories. And I try to apply it into my own life and I'm in a lucky position um, to do that. Right. So no, I, I, I thank you, man, for this, to be honest. Well, let's uh, agree on thanking each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and this positiveness we yeah. got going on here in this world right after that will smith slap bam uh, everyone that's all anyone can talk about so i'm happy right we could just not we didn't even bring it up till my dumb ass decided to <laughs> bring it up again. oh man everybody uh, wants to talk about that the only thing i gotta say is uh, that that would not be viewed positively on in prison oh yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, no. what a bitch man <laughs> Totally. That's funny. That's great, man. Wow. This is a good way to sort of round this out. Uh, I'll, yeah. uh, this will be the last um, question I ask you that I think you'll want to end on uh, for everyone listening and watching. Hi, this is a segment we call Reheat, where we look back at a past episode and recommend it again. So for today, this one's a little weird, a little special, but we're going to literally just recommend last week's episode because it's part one of this part two so you may be just watching this not knowing what's going on go back and watch last week's episode and hear part one of this conversation although they do stand alone um i i honestly suggest listening to the whole thing so that's what we're going to do we'll put a link in the description make sure you check out part one of this interview with johnny burke again just a, such a powerful story there's so much more this was like a thread that just like you pulled out and it was just just kept going right you just like the, the tip of the iceberg, um, you know, our, the Texas penal system needs a lot of help. And this is a discussion that could go further. So we probably will explore this topic, to be honest with you. I think Johnny opened the door for some of this. So anyway, let's get back to the episode with Johnny Burke. Hope you're enjoying it. As always, thank you so much for watching. What's your advice for folks who might be in your position years ago when you were ha you know in, in your in, in that moment um either about to go in right you know that that's going to happen you've got a few months to prepare or even maybe the moment after you got to write whatever you think is appropriate to tell people man want. i would say uh and i don't you know want to go too long on this but uh as i mentioned briefly earlier that was a really scary time for me uh i even uh had planned out where i was gonna run to and that was uh, illogically a weed farm that a friend of a friend of a friend owned in northern california that i was <laughs> just gonna go live off the grid at uh because there's that seemed much more logical to me than going to prison for however long i did not know i'd be out in a year at that point uh but, uh, you know, to this day, uh, say, uh, like I said, I still um, work a program and, and meet with somebody about my stuff and try to keep open with my friends about what's going on. You know, it's, it's a daily, uh, it doesn't always have to be a struggle, but, uh, you know, it's the thing to tell anybody dealing with a depressive episode is, hey, it's, it's going to get better. Uh, if you're at the lowest point in your life, there's, you know, I've never made any money at gambling, but, uh, as if I was a betting man, I would say, 
hey man, it, you know, it's probably going to go up from here. Um, especially if, it, you know, it took myself that time in there to find that strength that I go. Like I was talking about that first 47 days, I was locked up in county. I was like, yeah, oh man, I'm tough. You know, I've been around a uh, <laughs> friend, AR, man. He's like calling him AR because it's short for his initials, but it's short for AR 15. And he's like, I think he's killed some people, but he's going to do life. And, uh, you know, that's another one of the guys I still, I go, man, I, I need to send him another card soon or something. Cause he is locked up for life. One of the first guys, that, you know, big tough, my God made me feel, yeah, man, I can take this, but you could tell he was going away for life. He just wanted to, he liked my friendship and went, Hey man, you're going to be, you're going to be all right. You know? go hey man there's there are certain people whether it's right or wrong good or bad uh it's gonna uh, get you through the next situation and at the end of the day there's there's no point in ending it early on your uh, own accord and uh, if you're talking about that time right before i was locked up that was certainly a uh, a time in my life uh, I, I've been a, you know, gun enthusiast my whole life. It's it's still why I won't uh, keep guns in the house. I I won't, uh, and th that has nothing to do with my personal political beliefs. It's just where uh, where I was at the time got too close to. Uh, you thought you might use it on yourself. Yeah, came very close, and uh, to look back on it now goes, man. Uh, why would you, why would you do that? You know, like, like, I've, right now I've got, got my dog Otis right here, man. He's just been <laughs> sitting here the whole time, listening to me, bitch going, man. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, that seems so foolish now, but at the time it seemed to make such sense. And, uh, there will be a time later where it doesn't make any sense. And, uh, so yeah, keep up seems like such a cliche, but you, you'll keep on living and it, it'll be shitty for a while. It's not, I'm not there to say it'll be tough it, or sure. it won't be tough. It's uh, obviously the toughest thing I've ever had to do, but that's all relative because there's certainly much, much tougher things that other people have had to do. Oh, of course. Of course. No, man, I think that's great advice. Um, I, I think that's great advice, man. Absolutely. Awesome, dude. Well, listen, have a good rest of the day, brother, and we'll talk soon. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Johnny Burke. Remember, this is part two of our conversation with him. You can check out part one from last week. We'll put a link in the description. Um, what a wonderful episode, right? What a wonderful man, wonderful story, and so proud of him. Johnny, friends for life, brother. Wish you the best, man, moving forward. Got my respect. So, Coming up on next week's episode, we have Chef Scotty Scott. He's got a new cookbook out. It's absolutely phenomenal. We had him come in, cook a dish off the cookbook, and we just mic'd him up and had a bunch of cameras and just captured the whole thing and just talked. We had a great conversation while he cooked. Um, it was awesome. We're going to do more of those, and we really hope you enjoy it. This That's one of those ones. I hope you can watch that episode. But if you just have to listen to it, I think you're going to like it. You're going to hear the sizzles, the cuts of the knife, us discussing a bunch of cool food stuff and just his career and cooking in general. And it's just an awesome episode. He's a fun guy, hilarious. It's awesome. Really enjoyed it. So anyway, without further ado, thank you so much for this episode with Johnny Burke. And thank you so much for supporting us. Um, as always, we'll see you next week. Stay Lone Star. Have a great week, y'all. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more. We're using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, visit our website, lonestarplate.show. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time.